The Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands will now come to order. Uh, the Subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on the four bills uh, before us that include recreation areas and resource studies. Under Committee Rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the Chairman and the ranking uh, minority member. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the Clerk by 5 p.m. today. Hearing no objection, so ordered. I'll now proceed to read uh, an opening statement on behalf of uh, my good colleague, uh, Representative Halland, who is the uh, chair of this subcommittee who uh, will be joining us momentarily. Uh, I know that she wants uh, to thank everyone uh, for being here today for the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands first legislative hearing of the 116th Congress, in particular the members, Congressman Schiff and others, that will be presenting their bills, and of course the many witnesses who are gathered. The four public lands bills before the subcommittee today are an appropriate place for us to start this Congress because they touch on many of the priorities for this subcommittee and certainly for the committee as a whole. We will consider legislation that protects in, uh, intact natural landscapes, which preserves ecosystem services and helps us begin to adapt to climate change. We will also discuss legislation that protects recreational access, which promotes economic growth and provides well-paying jobs for communities across the United States, including my own. We will review a bill that highlights the importance of more equitable access to our public lands, and we will hear about the need to ensure that our public lands fully represent the diverse stories of the American experience. I know the chairwoman and the members of this committee look forward to working together with each of you to help our subcommittee embark on this new path forward. With respect to the particular bills that we'll be hearing today, uh, I, uh, Representative Nagus, will be presenting the CORE Act, which will benefit Coloradans balancing critical land and water protections while preserving appropriate opportunities for recreational use. Uh, Representative Schiff's legislation to protect the rim of the valley will provide recreational access to communities in urban areas. It will help ensure our public lands are accessible to all Americans while providing economic opportunities in Southern California. Representative Jackson Lee has worked very hard to highlight the harsh realities of American slavery through her Emancipation National Historic Trail Act. Uh, I certainly commend her efforts to focus on parts of the American experience that too often go untold and look forward to building off of this example. And finally, uh, Representative Heiss's Kettle Creek Battlefield Study will help us remember the enduring importance of passionate opposition to oppressive forces. These are all very important bills. I look forward to moving them through the legislative process, and I know that uh, the chairwoman looks forward to setting a fresh course for this subcommittee to follow throughout this Congress. Uh, I now would recognize uh, our ranking member, Curtis, for his opening statement. Thank you very much. As the chair noted, the subcommittee will consider four bills. H.R. 306, the Kettle Creek Battlefield Park Study Act, authored by Representative Jody Heiss of Georgia, directs the Secretary of the Interior to conduct a special resource study of the Kettle Creek Battlefield in Wilkes County, Georgia, to determine the national significance of the site and its suitability for inclusion as a unit of the national park system. The Battle of Kettle Creek during the American Revolution was one of the most important battles of the American Revolutionary War. While the National Park Service and other preservation organizations have done an especially diligent job preserving Civil War battlefields, considerably less Revolutionary War sites have been conserved. H.R. 306 offers the opportunity to study the Kettle Creek Battlefield site and determine the best options for preservation. Next, we'll be, we will be considering H.R. 434, the Emancipation National Historic Trail Act, offered by Representative Sheila Lee Jackson of Texas. The bill amends the National Trail System Act to establish the Emancipation National Historic Trail extending from Galveston to Houston, Texas. This trail will commence the Emancipation Proclamation and the Juneteenth holiday. Next, we will be considering H.R. 1708, the rim of the Valley Corridor Preservation Act, authored by Representative Adam Schiff of California. This bill adjusts the boundary of the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area in California to include the rim of, of the Valley unit. This bill adds approximately 191,000 acres to the existing 154 acres that currently comprise the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. This is a massive expansion to an already sprawling national recreation area. Of particular concern is the National Park Service's ability to reduce hazardous uh, fuels buildup without the expansion. Last year's Wolseley Fire burned nearly 100,000 acres of land, including more than 21,000 of the 23,595 acres, which is 88%, owned by the National Park Service within the National Recreation Area. This begs the question about whether this is the best time to expand the National Recreation Area 
by nearly 200,000 acres, even if only a portion of that acreage is federally owned. Finally, we'll be considering the H.R. 823, the Colorado Outdoor Recreation and Economy Act, authored by Representative Naguse of Colorado. This bill creates land restricted for approximately 400,000 acres of land in Colorado in the form of new wilderness recreation and conservation areas. While the stated goals of this legislation to protect and enhance outdoor recreation in Colorado are certainly admirable, and I do not have an ideological opposition to this effort, it is regrettably clear that the proposed language before us does not reflect a local consensus that I believe is critical for lands bills of this magnitude. While I appreciate the views of the stakeholders who support the bill, substantial stakeholder concerns about this bill have been raised by impacted counties, recreation groups, forestry health advocates, as well as the relevant federal agencies. Equally troubling is the fact that a significant portion of the lands impacted by this legislation are located in Congressman Scott Timpton's district in western Colorado. Congressman Tipton was not consulted on this legislation and in fact did not even hear about this bill until the day it was publicly announced. This sadly appears to be a troubling trend from my Democratic colleagues on this committee. Two months ago I offered an amendment to our committee rules to ensure greater transparency and member notification for bills impacting other members' districts. That was rejected as outlandish and unnecessary. Mere hours after that rule was voted down, many of those same committee members, without any prior notification or consultation with me or my staff, introduced an enormous lands bill that affected lands exclusively in my district. Public lands decisions should be made with local collaboration and input. They have real consequences for communities on the ground who live with the consequences of these significant federal land management decisions. As with any compromise, balance is key. There is no room for winner-take-all philosophy. If you want to achieve lasting public land management agreements, I saw this firsthand in Emory County where we work closely with our House delegation counterparts to earn their support before introducing legislation. I hope this committee will take the time to hear from all voices as we carry out our work, especially those most directly impacted by the legislation we seek to advance and those public land of officials who were elected to represent, represent those voices. I'd like to thank the witnesses for appearing before the subcommittee today and look forward to hearing their testimony. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Curtis. Uh, I would like to now turn to our first panel. Before I do so, uh, in addition, would want to ask for unanimous consent that Representative Tipton be allowed to join us on the dais, um, you know, certainly given that one of the bills does uh, impact lands in his district, one of the bills that we'll be considering today. Um, hearing no objections, so order. I would like to now turn to our first panel uh, and welcome the members of Congress who wish to testify on the bills they have sponsored. Under our committee rules, oral statements are limited to five minutes, but you may submit a longer statement for the record if you so choose. The lights in front of you, as you know, will turn yellow when there is one minute left and then red when time has expired. And the chair now recognizes uh, the distinguished gentleman from California, Mr. Schiff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, ranking member, and members of the committee. I'm here to testify on behalf of my legislation, H.R. 1708, the Rim of the Valley Corridor Preservation Act. If passed, uh, this bill would enlarge the size of the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area to include the lands known as the Rim of the Valley Corridor. This includes the Simi Hills, Santa Susana Mountains, Verdugo Mountains, part of Santa Clarita, San Gabriel Mountain Foothills, the L.A. River, and Griffith Park, all important green spaces in the greater Los Angeles region. My efforts to protect the Rim of the Valley began in the early 2000s upon the requests of many of my constituents. I soon introduced a bill to direct the National Park Service to conduct a special resource study to determine the suitability and feasibility of designated, designating all or a portion of the Rim of the Valley corridor as a unit of the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area and to study how these areas could be protected and utilized by local communities. Uh, that uh, study bill was a bipartisan bill uh, it was passed and President Bush signed it into law in 2008. The National Park Service began their study two years later in 2010 and transmitted its final report to Congress in February of 2016. The legislation before the committee today is based on the findings of the Park Service's report as well as the feedback received from many thousands of interested stakeholders across the Los Angeles region. It expands the Santa Monica Mountains Recreation Area by approximately 191,000 acres and incorporates much of the Park Service's final recommendations while also including and excluding certain areas based upon local feedback. Over the years, I held numerous town halls and conducted extensive outreach to inform my constituents 
uh, and those in the greater Los Angeles area about how this bill will preserve green space while also protecting private property rights and existing local land use authorities. Due to this outreach, uh, the bill has broad bipartisan and regional support as referenced by the letters of support provided to the committee from stakeholders. Uh, it does enjoy the support of uh, all of the members touched by this resource area. Uh, did so last session as well when they were Republican members among that delegation. Uh, at the federal level, my legislation is co-sponsored uh, now by every member in the vicinity of the rim of the valley. I'm also pleased that Senators Feinstein and Harris are carrying this legislation in the Senate. In drafting this bill, I benefited from guidance both by Chairman Grijalva and Ranking Member Bishop. The goal of the legislation is to enable local landowners, local governments, and interested stakeholders to better utilize federal resources and to preserve this beautiful ecosystem for generations to come, as well as improve access to nature for recreational and educational purposes. By expanding the recreation area, the Park Service will have the authority to implement capital improvements, like repairing hiking trails and maintaining facilities for public enjoyment, study wildlife and its habitats, uh, and participate in cooperative conservation with local land owners. Park Service will also be able to accept land donations or purchase land from willing sellers within the boundary if the Secretary deems appropriate. The expansion will respect property rights and existing local land use authorities. It will not require landowners to participate in any conservation or recreational, recreational activities. It will not put additional restrictions on property owners or businesses. Uh, furthermore, the legislation does not allow for land acquisition through eminent domain. With so much of LA County considered to be park poor, with 51% of residents living more than a mile to the nearest park, we must take steps to increase access. Preservation of open space in our communities is not only good for our environment and ecosystems, but beneficial to the health and well-being of residents of all ages. The Rim of the Valley Corridor is an area of striking natural beauty, and I feel strongly we just must do what we can to preserve the beauty uh, of this land for benefit of future LA residents and millions each year who visit and for future generations. I'm hopeful this committee can move the Rim of the Valley Corridor Preservation Act forward, uh, and I want to thank the chairwoman of the committee and the ranking member for holding this hearing, and I look forward to work with you on this important issue. Uh, and I'd also like to express my gratitude to Council Member Lorene West, uh, who has been a strong advocate of this legislation and protecting both the habitat and wildlife quarters uh, for many, many years to come, and I know you'll be hearing from her later in the hearing. Uh, I thank you, and at this point, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. I'll now yield uh, five minutes to myself uh, with respect to the CORE Act. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Chairwoman Halland, uh, as well as uh, Ranking Member Young, for agreeing to discuss this bill, which will continue Colorado's long and rich tradition of public land protection. Uh, as representatives for the people, our job is to fight for common sense solutions that come directly from our communities. When our constituents raise their voices and, we were a and when we are able to respond with legislation, that is when our work is most effective. I'm honored to be partnering with Senator Michael Bennett in combining four broadly supported bills, many of which have been introduced uh, in prior Congresses, into one legislative package, the Colorado Outdoor Recreation and Economy Act, or the CORE Act. The CORE Act would conserve over 400,000 acres of public lands, some of which you can see on the screens on the left and right right now. This includes nearly 100,000 acres surrounding the Continental Divide, 60,000 acres in the San Juan Mountains, um, and it would also protect over 200,000 acres in the Thompson Divide from future oil and gas leases. I am very proud to say uh, that the CORE Act was created by Coloradans over a decade uh, of collaboration. Local elected officials, businesses, conservation groups, ranchers, sportsmen, all hammered on out compromises to construct solutions for protecting our public lands. And each portion of this bill has been carefully written and vetted over many years by a thoughtful group of stakeholders. And so while I appreciate uh, Ranking Member uh, Curtis's uh, comments uh, in his opening statement, I think it's important for me to highlight that the legislative provisions impacting my district, just by way of example, have gained support from the towns of Breckenridge, Dillon, Frisco, Minturn, Vail, and over 150 local Colorado businesses. The CORE Act is also supported by a majority of Colorado's congressional delegation and the counties of Summit, Eagle, San Juan, Ray, San Miguel, Gunnison, Pitkin, the cities of Glenwood Springs, Carbondale, the towns of Ridgeway, Crested Butte, Telluride, Basalt, many more. Uh, it's clear uh, that this bill uh, is desired by many Coloradans across the political spectrum back home. They want protection for the incredible special landscapes included uh, in the CORE Act. Uh, it's also worth emphasizing that the desire 
uh, for this bill goes beyond the ethics of conservation. It makes economic sense. In Colorado, outdoor recreation brings in $28 billion in consumer spending annually, contributes 2,200,000 direct jobs, and nearly $10 billion in wages. Year-round, over 2 million, or excuse me, over 82 million visitors come to Colorado for our world-class outdoor recreation opportunities. My district alone, Colorado's second congressional district, is home to 498 outdoor companies. Uh, this bill is supported by many recreation groups across the country and certainly in Colorado, including the International Mountain Bicycling Association, the Outdoor Industry Association, the Conservation Alliance, the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, Conservation Colorado, and the Wilderness Society. Finally, the CORE Act also honors the legacy of the Army's 10th Mountain Division, which is something that I wanted to emphasize. And it does so by creating the first ever National Historic Landscape at Camp Hale. It was in the mountains of Colorado, uh, the mountains that I represent, that American soldiers received training that allowed them to defeat Germans in the Italian Alps during World War II. This designation will ensure that future generations learn about that important history of the 10th Mountain Division and appreciate the sacrifices of our service members. Finally, while this bill conserves uh, our wild and historic landscapes for outdoor recreation, it was created with an even wider variety of stakeholders in mind. This bill considers ranchers and farmers by allowing for continued grazing in areas proposed for wilderness or special management designation, something that I know has been very important uh, to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle in the past. This bill also considers water users by including Colorado's preferred headwaters language to protect existing water rights and facilities. It considers resource management, providing explicit permission for the Forest Service to carry out activities to control the spread of disease and fight wildfires. And this bill considers the important role of the DOD in assisting the cleanup of unexploded ordnance and other legacy environmental has hazards at Camp Hale, protecting public health and safety. Conversations with these stakeholders and countless others have occurred literally over the past 10 years. There are a lot of people gathered in this hearing room today um, who have been a part of those many conversations. And we will certainly work in partnership and continue to do so with Senator Bennett and affected groups and other members uh, of this body uh, to meet the objectives of this bill. I just want to close by uh, reminding everyone here, you know, folks across states, regions, and party lines came together to pass the John D. Dingle Jr. Conservation Management and Recreation Act. That was a bill that passed uh, on a bipartisan basis. I was proud to support it. It provided 1.3 million acres of new protections for public lands across the United States, but only a few hundred acres of the newly protected acreage was in Colorado. And while that was disappointing, we now have an opportunity in this committee to discuss legislation that was created in Colorado by Coloradans to conserve Colorado. And so for all those reasons, I look forward to working with the committee and my colleagues on ensuring that this important piece of legislation moves forward. And with that, I don't believe the other two members are here with respect to their bills, so I think we will move on to panel two. Uh, I will uh, again thank Congressman Schiff, uh, who I was here earlier, for uh, his valuable testimony, and I know the other members uh, will be submitting, I believe, testimony for the record as well. Uh, I would now invite panel two to take their places at the Mr. witness. Sir, can I ask just yes, a point sir. of order? Are, will, will we have a time um, to comment on um, the bill that you just referred to, or would you prefer that we wait with Mr. Tipton? Okay, I, I have a statement too that Sorry. I'd like to make when appropriate. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Curtis. I think it's probably more appropriate to make that statement during the course of the, the questioning, the five minutes that you will have to question witnesses on panel two as well as witnesses in panel three. That'll be three. fine. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, as with, uh, I would now invite panel two to take their places at the witness table. Um, as with the first panel, oral statements are limited to five minutes, but your entire statement will uh, certainly be part of the hearing record. Uh, the lights in front of you will turn yellow when there is one minute left, uh, and they will turn red when the time has expired. Uh, after the witnesses have testified, members will then be given the opportunity to ask them questions. Uh, the chair will now recognize Mr. Chris French, uh, Acting uh, Deputy Chief of the National uh, Forest System. Thank you, Mr. French, for appearing today. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, members of the subcommittee. My name is Chris French, and I serve as the Acting Deputy Chief for the National Forest System of the USDA Forest Service. 
Um, of the four bills before the subcommittee today, I'm here to testify regarding H.R. 823, the Colorado Outdoor Recreation and Economy Act. <clears throat> I provided written testimony for the record. In summary, the core act includes provisions that pertain to management of national forests in Colorado, including the designation of new wildernesses, establishment of recreation management areas, mineral withdrawals, and other administrative provisions. Generally, the Forest Service supports provisions of this legislation implementing land management practices that are consistent with applicable forest plans and have broad-based local support. I'll address each of these relevant titles of the bill separately. Title I, the Continental Divide, proposes to designate additional acres to the uh, Ptarmigan Peak Wilderness. Within this proposal, the forest plan recommends wilderness designation for the proposed Ute, plant, Ute Pass Wilderness Edition and the proposed Acorn Creek Wilderness Edition. And therefore, because it's in that plan, the agency supports these designations. However, the agency does not support the proposed uh, Ptarmigan Wilderness Edition or the proposed Straight Creek Wilderness Edition, since designation in these areas will limit mechanized management activities needed to maintain wildlife habitat and is not consistent with recommendations in the forest plan. The bill also proposes to designate the proposed Megan Dickey Wilderness. We cannot support this proposal because the forest plan does not recommend any of this area for wilderness designation, and there is likely a likelihood of unexploded ordinances in the area that would require mitigation using mechanized equipment. The 10-mile wilderness proposal encompasses landing sites for helicopters, which are needed for rescues several times a year. The Forest Service does not support the proposed addition as it's currently written. The Forest Service does support parts of the Freeman Creek and the Sprattle Creek additions that are recommended for wilderness in the forest plan. However, additional wilderness designations beyond these are inconsistent with the forest plan, present access issues, restrict habitats that are actively managed, and remove areas from active forest management. <clears throat> The agency does not support the addition of the proposed Hoosier Ridge Wilderness or the Williams Fork Wilderness as they were not recommended for designation in the forest plan and may contain roads. The proposed 10-mile recreation management area would remove nearly 3,500 acres from active management consideration. The agency does not support this section as written and would like to work with the committee and the bill sponsor to ensure that the area will remain available for commercial timber harvest and fuel reduction activities. The proposed Porcupine Gulch and Williams Fork conservation areas are largely consistent with the 2002 forest plan. The proposed Camp Hale National Historic Landscape is generally consistent with the current forest uh, plan, and we look forward to working with the committee on this. Title II, the Core Act proposes to designate several parcels of the Grand Mesa, Uncompagre, and Gunnison National Forest, totaling nearly 23,000 acres as wilderness. Additionally, the bill proposes a mineral withdrawal of 6,590 acres. The GMUG forests are currently revising their forest plan. During the plan revision process, the forest is working with the public to identify lands that may be recommended for wilderness designation. Due to this ongoing public process, USDA believes a formal position on wilderness designations and mineral withdrawal would be premature at this time. In Title III, the Thompson Divide, H.R. 823 includes a mineral withdrawal of approximately 187,000 acres on the Gunnison National Forest. The Forest Service supports domestic energy and mineral production, including critical minerals, as an important use of National Forest System lands. We oppose the proposed withdrawal as it would have adverse effects on current leaseholders and would not be consistent with the forest plan. In addition, the forest is working with the public to identify lands that may be open to oil, gas, and coal development as part of the plan vision process. Due to this ongoing public process, USDA does not support a withdrawal at this time. The Curacante Natural Recreation Area, the bill transfers jurisdiction of approximately 2,500 acres of the Gunnison National Forest to the Park Service as part of establishing this national recreation area. The Forest Service supports continued efforts to establish the National Recreation Area boundary by incorporating the historical 710 acres of inholdings, but does not support the additional transfer of National Forest System lands where active management, including timber harvesting and fuels treatment, is occurring. Thank you. This concludes my remarks on the CORE Act, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have.
Thank you, Mr. French. I would now recognize uh, Mr. Dan Smith, Deputy Director of the National Park Service. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for coming. Congressman Nagus and Congressman Curtis and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to present the Department of the Interior's views on the four bills on today's agenda. I'd like to submit our full statements for the record, and I will sub summarize the Department's views. One statement is on H.R. 823, the Colorado Outdoor Recreation and Economy Act, which contains provisions affecting the Bureau of Reclamation, the Bureau of Land Management, and the U.S. Forest Service, as well as the National Park Service. My colleague from the Forest Service has responded uh, to their point of view on this bill, and I would request that the subcommittee refer any questions relevant to the Bureau of Land Management or Bureau of Reclamation directly to those bureaus. Two provisions of H.R. 823 are applicable to the National Park Service. One of them, Section 109, would provide for maintenance and use of the Trail River Ranch in Rocky Mountain National Park by designated a 15 and a half acre area proposed wilderness as non-wilderness. The department supports this provision. The other provision, Title IV, would establish a legislative boundary for the Cura County National Recreation Area and transfer lands from the Bureau of Reclamation, the Bureau of Land Management, and the U.S. Forest Service to the National Park Service. Title IV also requires continued recreation access, maintains grazing rights, and authorizes conservation assistance to adjacent landowners. The National Park Service currently manages the National Recreation Area under the Colorado River Storage Project Act of 1956 and a 1965 Memorandum of, of Agreement with the Bureau of Reclamation. Public Law 106-76, enacted in 1999, required the National Park Service to study alternatives and make recommendations that would better conserve resources within and surrounding Cura Conte National Recreation Area. Title IV generally appears to address recommendations of that study. However, due to the complexity of this legislation and the need for coordination between three affected interior bureaus as well as the U.S. Forest Service, the administration is continuing to review this title at this time. We look forward to the, working with the committee and the sponsor on this legislation. H.R. 306 would direct the National Park Service to conduct a special resource study of the Cradle Creek Battlefield in Wilkes County, Georgia. The department recognizes that the battlefield represents an important story in American Revolutionary War history. It is the site of a skirmish where 400 Georgia patriots defeated a larger force of British loyalists on February 14, 1779. However, in 2014, the National Park Service National Historic Landmark Program concluded that the site did not meet the criteria for designation as a National Historic Landmark. For this reason, we do not believe Kettle Creek Battlefield is a good candidate for a special restudy, resource study, and therefore we do not support enactment of H.R. 306. In addition, Congress has previously authorized 30 studies to determine if certain areas or resources meet the appropriate criteria for designation as part of the national park system. These 30 studies are not yet completed. Only a week ago, nine of those studies were authorized as part of Public Law 116-9, at this time, the administration needs to resources to reduce the National Park Service 11.9 deferred maintenance backlog and address other con con needs, and the department is not in a position to spend funds on conducting additional studies. H.R. Three, three, four, three, sorry, 434 would designate the study an Emancipation National Historic Trail in Texas. The trail is a series of routes extending approximately 51 miles that follow a migration route taken in 1865 by newly freed enslaved people and other persons of African descent from Galveston to the community of Freemanstown, now a part of Houston. The department recognizes that the subject of this bill represents an important story in American history. However, we do not support enactment of H.R. 434 at this time. It appears to be unprecedented for Congress to authorize a trail study and provide for designation in the same bill. The study's requirements are premised on the idea that it is critical for Congress to have the information provided by a study before making a decision about whether a trail should be included in the national trail system. Even if H.R. 434 were amended to provide only for a study, the department would not support the bill at this time due to the funding priorities that I just mentioned beforehand. H.R. 17808 
we do not support it this time uh, uh, because of um, uh, uh, be because of uh, a lot of uh, the same reasons that I just mentioned about our deferred maintenance. This concludes my statement. I look forward to answering questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for your valuable testimony. The chair will now recognize members for questions. And under committee rule 3D, each member will be recognized for five minutes. And uh, I would like to first recognize um, Ms. DeGette. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the, I want to thank you for your committee and also Mr. Nagus in letting me question. I have another um, briefing that I'm running in just a few minutes. It's busy right now. I also want to thank the witnesses for coming and I particularly want to thank my old, well not, my longtime friend Dan Gibbs, who's the Executive Director of the Department of National, Natural Resources for Colorado for being here. We've worked together on many, many issues. And I particularly want to thank my um, seatmate here, Mr. Nagus, for introducing this bill. Um, it's a wonderful bill. And that is really important to the economy and to the preservation of our state. Um, I'm a fourth generation Coloradoan and I know how important the protecting the public lands um, are to make our state the place to live that it really is now. And that's why I'm really proud to sponsor the Coast Corps Act with Mr. Nagus and uh, Senator Bennett which protects an additional 400,000 acres of public land in Colorado, 73,000 of which would be additional wilderness. And also why very soon I'm going to be reintroducing my Colorado Wilderness Act, which uh, working with the delegation, which will um, designate approximately 700,000 additional acres of wilderness, most of which are currently uh, BLM wilderness study area. I, so, Mr. French, I kind of want to direct my questions to you. I want to talk to you about, um, about wilderness in particular, but also mul the multiple use mandate. You know that the Forest Service has a multiple use mandate that was established under the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act, which has been in effect since 1960. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, now, do you agree that some Forest Service lands should be managed to provide resource development? Yes, that is part of our mission. And do you agree also that some Forest Service land is appropriate for mechanized recreation? Yes. And do you also agree that some for Forest Service land with exceptional wilderness characteristics as defined by the Act should be permanently protected as wilderness? Yes, that, that is the role of Congress. To Great. Designate. So sometimes we hear objections to wilderness designations from people who worry that that will make it more difficult for them to enjoy their favorite public lands, not realizing sometimes, I think, everything you can do in wilderness. So I wanted to ask you a couple questions about that. Is hiking allowed in the wilderness? Yes. How about camping? Yes. How about horseback riding? Yes. Canoeing? Yes. And how about hunting? Yes. And how about fishing? Yes. And um, and uh, they're, they're, it, in wilderness, also, they're allowed to allow mechanized equipment into wilderness in emergency situations. Is that right? <clears throat> in emergency situations, yes. we go through a process that can allow that. That can allow that. And also, in wilderness areas, um, people um, who have grazing rights are allowed to keep those grazing rights in the wilderness areas. Is that correct? If those rights were established bef before the wilderness was... That's correct. And, and they're also allowed to have access to maintain those grazing, um, those grazing rights pursuant to the permitting process. Is that also right? Yes. Okay. So there's lots of ways for us to enjoy public lands that, e that are just Forest Service lands multi-use. Is that right? Yes. And there's also a lot of ways for us to, to, um, to enjoy the wilderness areas. Is that right? That is correct. In fact, the whole purpose of wilderness designation is to preserve the exceptional lands that meet the criterion in the Act so that future generations will have the same chance to um, enjoy them. Is that right? Um, 
Yes, I would agree with that. Okay. Now, Madam Chair, in Colorado, only 3.7 million acres, or 5.6% of the lands in Colorado, are protected as wilderness. And if enacted, the CORE Act would add 73,000 acres of wilderness, which is about one-tenth of 1%. 1 but it would also take the rest of these lands in the bill and manage them in ways that are appropriate for those lands. So it seems to me that um, it's clear that the public interest is to permanently protect these special places. And, and I just want to say one more thing um, about this bill and my wilderness bill. According to the 2019 Conservation in the West poll released, released by Colorado College, my alma mater, 73% of Coloradoans say the ability to live near and enjoy public lands was a significant reason to live, that they live in the West. These folks are counting on us to preserve their lands. So thank you very much, Mr. Nagus, for introducing this bill. I'm delighted to be a co-sponsor. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ms. DeGette. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Curtis. Thank you. And uh, Sherman Holland, it's great to have you with us. Uh, we were in good hands with your acting yes. chair while you were gone. I'd like to uh, take just a minute to address uh, his bill. And I want to make sure that, that Mr. Nagus is, is really clear that I applaud his efforts. I, I, having the district that I have with the public lands issues I have, I know how important this work is and how hard it, it is to get a bill of this nature through. And um, also, I'm, I'm grateful and I applaud the fact that you're using the tool of the congressional legislation rather than the Antiquities Act. I really think that's an important thing for this committee. I would say, however, and going back to my comments, I, I want to be clear that they weren't meant to be derogative of you, your efforts, or the bill, but rather um, an experience tells me that in, for this bill to eventually be successful, it must undergo the rigorous process of compromise and working with all the stakeholders, and that the, the goal of getting uh, the, representation, the representation locally, congressional representation of Mr. Tipton, to support and, and really endorse this bill is critical because I don't think it makes it through the long process without that. And that to get this bill through, it ultimately needs that type of support. I know from firsthand experience, having introduced a public lands bill myself too early, that it was doomed to failure. Uh, as a new representative, I introduced one that, that had no chance of success. And it wasn't until I'd been in a year and had the opportunity to introduce a bill that had gone through decades of stakeholder uh, work and compromise to get that bill to the point where we could not only get it through the House, but more importantly, get it through the Senate and signed by the President. So I just want to be clear that uh, encourage your efforts, but hope that, that we'll be able to get the support of uh, Mr. Uh, Tipton and those as well. Uh, I'd like to take just a question, uh, question or two for Mr. Smith um, in reference to the H.R. 1708 Rim of the Valley Corridor Preservation Act. Um, I, let me come back to my opening statement about the fire and the issues of um, are we ready uh, to expand, uh, given the fact that uh, we, we have a hard time dealing with our current backlog of, of parks and the, the fire management there. Could you comment on your, your feeling that we're ready to expand and we have the resources to maintain this? Congressman, thank you for that question. Uh, that fire was especially devastating. 21 of our 23,000 acres were burned. Uh, and as you know, the intent of this National Recreation Area is not for the National Park Service to own this acreage. We only own 15 percent of, of that. Uh, because of our backlog maintenance issue, uh, we are not at this time uh, supportive of any addition, doubling of the size of, of, of this uh, National Recreation Area. Obviously, the counties involved uh, can, can manage this land and, and conserve it, and the Park Service is not ready to take on that responsibility at this time. With our $11.9 billion backlog, and uh, that actually was increased in this area because of what we lost during that fire. Thank you. I think that actually sets me up well for my next question, which is uh, that does involve a, a lot of uh, proximity to private land and, and, and private land in this. And as I understand it right now, Los Angeles is actually going through the North Area Plan which is putting a lot of pressure on that area to conform to issues that are usually very compatible with national parks, whether it's noise or uh, scenic views and, and, and things like that. And, and, and thus, we're kind of putting a lot of pressure on these private lands to conform to 
uh, national park standards, uh, even though they're private uh, issues such as how much noise they can have at, at, at 8 o'clock at night that normally would be allowed in that area and, and, and the zoning pressures that come from that. Can you tell me whether the National Park Service actively works with the County of Los Angeles to encourage zoning that is compatible with national parks? And is that an appropriate role, if so, uh, for the national parks to be taken? We're certainly aware of those planning efforts that go on in, in state and local government. We have no jurisdiction over those uh, uses in, on private lands, but obviously uh, we, are, we are aware of those efforts as they move forward. Um, one of our other major concerns in all the Western states is this act also would allow the possibility of land acquisition, and we simply at this point in time do not seek any land acquisition in this area. I'm almost out of time, but can you, can you maybe comment quickly on the appropriateness of even the national parks setting forth an agenda or uh, issues that would be dictated in local zoning? We usually avoid that in local zoning. That's not our jurisdiction. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, I yield my time. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. The chair now recognizes Mr. Nagoose for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I want to start, I do have a question for uh, Mr. French, but uh, before I get there, I appreciate the comments of, of uh, my colleague, Mr. Curtis, uh, and I'm certainly looking forward to working with him and other members of this committee uh, as we move this bill forward. I just, contextually, it's important to emphasize, uh, although uh, I may be new, this bill is not. <laughs> so this is a, a bill, uh, the components of which have been introduced repeatedly over the last decade. Uh, there are four different titles to the bill. Uh, the title uh, that most uh, pronouncedly kind of impacts my district uh, was actually introduced by my predecessor, uh, Congressman Polis, now Governor Polis of the great state of Colorado. Uh, and the other titles of the bill uh, with respect to the San Juans and, and other areas, the Thompson Divide, again, are uh, component pieces that have been introduced uh, year after year in many cases, uh, and which have been the subject of very exhaustive stakeholder processes uh, over the, the better part of the last decade, similar, I suspect, to the, the many efforts uh, that I know, Mr. Curtis, you and your office engage in as well with respect to bills that you pursue. Uh, many of those folks, I should just say, are here today, and I want to thank them uh, because ultimately without them, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have a bill. Um, they are uh, indeed the authors, they are the proponents, and, and, uh, and I'm very proud uh, to be part of their coalition. Uh, there are many county commissioners, ranchers, mountain bikers, community members, uh, some of whom will be on our second and third panel. And so they ultimately represent nearly all the constituencies touched by this bill, uh, and many of them have been working on the CORE Act for a very long time. Uh, I want to submit to that end, to the record, uh, I would ask, seek unanimous consent, uh, to, seek, uh, to submit to the record letters from state officials, seven counties, uh, eight cities and towns, and countless local businesses, sportsmen, outdoor recreation groups, and conservation organizations in support of uh, the CORE Act. I ask unanimous consent that this item be part of the hearing record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so with respect to my questions, Mr. French, uh, it, both witnesses, thank you, for, of course, for coming and, and for appearing today and, and for your testimony. Certainly appreciate, uh, Mr. French, your comments with respect to working with you and, and the Forest Service uh, as we uh, proceed to a markup and, and ultimately uh, push to, to have this bill uh, pass both chambers and signed into law. Uh, I do have a question with respect to the forest plan, just because I want to make sure contextually that I'm understanding this uh, correctly, as we were in receipt of your written testimony yesterday, it's the first we had sort of heard of with respect to the objections around uh, the proposed wilderness designations comporting with the forest plan. My understanding is uh, that the forest plans are promulgated pursuant to the National Forest Management Act of 1976. Is that correct? That is correct. And my understanding is that there's also a statutory requirement uh, that the forest plans be revised at least every 15 years. Is that That's, correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, so I guess I would just, uh, you know, think it's important, again, contextually to note uh, that much of the objection, as I understand it from your written testimony, uh, in that, with respect to this piece of it, that uh, the wilderness area is not comporting with the forest plan uh, designations, uh, that the forest plan, at least with respect to White River, is designed in 2002. And so we have now blown through uh, that forest plan timeline in terms of revising it. And, and ultimately, I mean, the plan should comport with the needs and the concerns of the local communities, uh, in my view. I suspect, I, I would hope that you would agree with that. Uh, and so uh, that perhaps is, is something else uh, that we as a Congress can work uh, uh, to ensure that, that ultimately your agency 
uh, is, is pursuing that path so that ultimately the forest plans are, are up to date um, and reflect the values of, uh, of the constituents uh, that we represent whom live in these, these treasured areas. So with that, I would uh, yield back to my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nagus. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Tipton for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and appreciate the time uh, and to be able to work on the committee here as well. Uh, I don't know if my colleague, Mr. Nagus, just had a couple of questions, if the bill's sponsor would be willing to maybe answer a couple of questions. Mi uh, Mr. Tipton, the purpose of this hearing is to um, ask the witnesses questions. I, I think that you and Mr. Nagus can talk amongst yourselves outside of the hearing, okay. please. Thank I you. appreciate that, Madam Chair. And again, thank you for the opportunity to be able to be here with the committee today. Uh, obviously, our public lands, uh, particularly in the West, uh, are critical to our livelihoods, our way of life. And uh, for those of us that had the blessing of being born and raised there, uh, it plays a very critical role in uh, just our well-being and uh, all of our communities. That's why, uh, specifically, in our legislation, we'd supported S-47, the public lands package, which permanently reauthorized the Land and Water Conservation Fund and fought to be able to preserve the Canyon of the Ancients in southwest Colorado. Introduced legislation this Congress to be able to expand the Yucca House National Monument and worked with a broad group of public land advocates and conservation groups and recreation advocates to be able to develop the Hermosa Creek Wilderness and Special Management Area. So obviously public lands play a critical role. And uh, I'd like to talk to Mr. French just a little bit about some of the Forest Service plans. I think that uh, uh, you just indicated that in terms of the management plans that you have for the Forest Service, that under the CORE Act, they do not align uh, in terms of wilderness designation with Forest Service plan. Is that correct? Yeah, each time we revise our land management plans, we make recommendations to Congress following a process established in a rule. Uh, in these cases, that that's happened at least twice or three times. Okay, so on this, uh, you've done it twice or, or three times uh, to be able to update the plan. What are gonna be some of the conflicts that you see in terms of the areas that are being proposed as wilderness? So when we go through a forest plan revision, um, we start by looking at the entire area and doing an assessment of the needs of that area. Um, and of that is an assessment of looking at what areas we would call as designated areas. That includes recommendations to Congress. We look at competing needs for that land and balance both the ecological and social. So it may be we're looking at fire and insect and disease risk and the type of treatments we may need to do in an area versus a preservation management system that you would have in wilderness. And would you express maybe a little bit, I think you spoke a bit to it in your testimony, about maybe some potential concerns that you may have about your ability to be able to perform active management activities should this bill become law? In, in some areas, if we were to, some of our fuels reduction or our active forest management for forest restoration, if it were to require mechanized equipment or commercial a harvest or commercial crews to do that work, we wouldn't be able to do that in, those, in the, these designations. Okay. Uh, with threat of fire, that's something that's obviously a great threat out in the West. We experienced that in a broad, broad variety of areas in Colorado, unfortunately, this last year. So that needs to be part of the equation in terms of managing the public lands, how we can address and be able to protect our communities, to be able to protect our watersheds, to be able to protect wildlife, to be able to protect endangered species. Yes, that is part of our broader land management planning process, like what's happening right now in the GMUG. Um, we look at all of those issues and the different management systems. And it's not just fighting the fire, it's thinking about what you need to do now to help reduce the risk of fire in the future. Great, thank you so much, I appreciate your comments. And uh, Madam Chair, at this time, we've heard that there is, and uh, I've spoken to a lot of folks uh, that are supportive of the concepts that are in the CORE Act. Uh, but I think that it is important to note that uh, we do still have differing opinions uh, that are in my district that may not have had their voices heard in development of some of this legislation. Uh, 
And I'd like to be able to offer into the record several items, an article from the Post Independent out of Garfield County uh, with Garfield County's concerns with permanent mineral lease withdrawal on the Thompson Divide, a letter from the Colorado Wool Growers Association expressing concerns over additional wilderness designations in Colorado, and letters from the Colorado Snowmobile Association, Colorado Off-Highway Vehicle Coalition, the Trails Preservation Alliance, outlining their concerns about losing recreation access under the proposal. And additionally, I'd like to be able to offer into the record a letter from the Intermountain Forest Association express, expressing its opposition to the proposal due to the impact that it would have on forest management activities uh, that Mr. French was just addressing. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Madam Chair. My time's expired, and again, I appreciate the opportunity to participate on the panel. Um, the chair will recognize Mr. Heiss. I, I can go last. I'm happy to do that. So please, five minutes. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate you holding a hearing on, on my bill, H.R. 306, the Kettle Creek Battlefield Study Act. In May of 1791, President George Washington entered Georgia's then capital, Augusta, having arrived there from Savannah. He rode through Broad Street with Governor Telfair uh, and George Walton, as you know, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. There were great cheers and applause. Some 40 miles away, just outside the city of Washington, Georgia, sits War Hill, which was the epicenter of the Revolutionary War site, Battle of Kettle Creek. The city of Washington, Georgia is in Wilkes County. It's roughly 100 miles east of Atlanta between Athens and Augusta, it's in my district. Washington, Georgia was chartered in 1780 in recognition of President Washington, who confirmed himself that Washington, Georgia was the first to be named in his honor. He noted on that visit in 1791 that the Battle of Kettle Creek broke the spirit of the Tories for a time and preserved quiet in the rest. For those who are unfamiliar with this battle, it took place in February, February 14th, 1779. It is recognized as the only significant patriot victory in the state of Georgia. And during this period, the British had engaged in what they referred to as a Southern strategy. They had captured Augusta, they had captured Savannah, and they were moving upward throughout Georgia. Uh, and when they, uh, uh, came into Georgia, there were a couple of leaders, uh, Colonel John Dooley and Pickens, who engaged the battle that I'm referring to, the Battle of Kettle Creek. Um, uh, British Lieutenant Colonel John Boyd was moving some 800 men into the area, and as I mentioned, it took place February 14th. Uh, and needless to say, uh, Boyd was defeated at that battle. It is a significant battle, and I am uh, just frankly disappointed to hear that the Park Service's uh, in the testimony downplays the significance of this battle. I think it's important in any examination of history that we find out and we look at the opinion of those who were there and not just come up with our own Colonel Pickens said of that battle himself. I've been very particular about my account of the affair of Kettle Creek because the circumstances that led to it are not generally known and because I believe it was the severest check and chastisement the Tories ever received in South Carolina or Georgia. Uh, Kettle Creek is additionally the location where the famed African-American patriot Austin Dabney was injured during the war and who was later awarded 50 acres of land in Washington County, not too far away from Washington, Georgia. In 2007, the report to Congress on Historic Preservation of Revolutionary, Revolutionary War and War of 1812 sites in the United States, the American Battlefield Protection Program of the National Park Service noted the Battle of Cattle Creek is having demonstrable influence on the course, conduct, and results of the Revolutionary War. They rated the site as a Class C, medium to high, long-term threat, priority to battlefield. 
The site is also listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and that took place in 1975. And I'm, I'm frankly at a loss as to why the Park Service would reverse the position and testify today that the site is not a good candidate. Uh, it makes little sense that the service can make that determination without first conducting a feasibility study, which my bill, H.R. 306, requests. Uh, the interior should not allow a maintenance backlog, which falls to program uh, management of the Park Service, uh, to be valid reason for failing to carry out other duties of the Park Service. We've done a great deal in this country to preserve the history of our of the Civil War, but frankly, we are watching Revolutionary War sites disappear. And this is a major one in the South. Um, and so, Madam Chair, my time is expiring, but I, again, I just wanna say thank you for hosting the hearing on the bill today. I believe Kettle Creek is perfectly qualified as a candidate for study uh, for inclusion in the park system, and I look forward to discussing this further along. I yield back, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Heiss. Uh, I will recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Deputy Director Smith, the National Park Service conducted a study that was transmitted to Congress in 2016, which found that the rim of the Valley Corridor had numerous nationally significant resources that merited further protection. Can you elaborate on the significance of these resources? Chairman Holland, uh, I, I am not aware of, I'm not aware of that study. However, uh, in this whole area surrounding uh, these counties in Los Angeles County, obviously there are natural and cultural resources in, in those areas. Uh, that study was very comprehensive in the last administration and uh, certainly reflects all those uh, type of issues that are, that are there in the, in the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. Uh, Again, looking at circumstances we have today, and especially after this devastating fire that we had, in, with, along with many devastating fires in California Thank this you. last year, okay. uh, at this time. That's fine. Thank you. Well, I'll go on to my next question. In your testimony, you recommended Congress not proceed forward with this bill, citing the maintenance backlog. Did these valuable and important resources somehow disappear? We did lose resources, uh, buildings, uh, and, uh, n and natural resources in that fire, yes. Okay. The Park Service cannot use the maintenance backlog as a blanket rationale for not protecting our resources, especially when your most recent budget requested that Congress slash funding for maintenance and construction. Your own internal study found significant resources that merited further protections. These resources would open outdoor recreation access to over 13 million people many of whom are in underrepresented communities that lack access to green space and outdoor recreation. We recognize the agency has to prioritize resources. I'm sure you and I will speak about that at tomorrow's budget hearing, but we cannot ignore resource protection and potential benefits to millions of people, especially those who are already cut out of decision making. Um, and my next question goes to Mr. French. The CORE Act incorporates input from numerous state and local stakeholders to ensure it meets the recreational, economic, and land management needs of communities in the area. The Forest Service has promoted the importance of customer service and shared stewardship with communities. Can you speak to the importance of these ideas, whether it is in consideration of protective designations, wildfire, and land management decisions, or preserving clean water and wildlife habitat? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, um, broad public engagement, collaboration, working with local groups and broad stakeholder groups are incredibly important. That is why the land management planning process for looking at designations for wilderness is a very long and broad process and involves lots and lots of stakeholders. That's why we generally, in bills like this, um, will give our, uh, we will basically say whether we are supportive or not of any recommendation based on the outcomes of that process, which starts from public engagement. Thank you. 
Uh, I, for the record, I'd like to submit a letter from seven county commissioners whose counties touched the CORE Act, recognizing that this bill was drafted alongside the timber industry, landowners, homeowners, and forest managers, despite what some have claimed here today. The CORE Act does represent local needs, and it certainly prioritizes healthy Colorado forests. And I have the letter without objection. So moved. Thank you. And I have a little bit of time left, so I'll go back to you, Mr. Smith. As Ms. Lowell noted in her testimony, certain sites along the proposed route of the Emancipation National, National Historic Trail have already received international recognition, recognition from UNESCO. Do you believe NPS can play a role in further highlighting the internationally significant resources across the United States? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. And why is it particularly important that the National Park Service highlight the histories of underrepresented communities, in your opinion? Well, in our opinion, we, through acts of Congress, we certainly do that in, in many of our national historic uh, areas uh, that have been, that have moved through Congress. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I thank you both for your testimony. I, we appreciate you taking the time to be here today uh, for your valuable testimony, and we will now move to our third panel. Uh, I would like unanimous consent that Representative Jackson Lee be allowed to join us on the dais, as I understand portions of one of the bills under consideration today impacts the lands in her district. Five minutes, Ms. Jackson Lee. I thank the chairwoman very much for her courtesies and uh, thank her for uh, having H.R. 434 uh, be on the agenda for today. I'm very pleased to take note of the fact uh, that uh, Congressman Weber uh, is uh, supporting this legislation. In fact, it is bipartisan legislation. A good part of uh, the land area is in Congressman Weber's district and in my district. Uh, and so we have a, a perfect combination of interests in this legislation. Let me uh, quickly uh, indicate uh, that we are very pleased to have such far-reaching support for this legislation, uh, and you'll soon hear the testimony of one of our very uh, important witnesses, uh, Ms. Lawal, who will be testifying in just a short order. But let me frame uh, this in uh, the appropriate time frame. As I do so, I would like to recognize Ms. Naomi Mitchell Carrier, who was instrumental as a historian uh, because of her efforts to preserve and share the stories of newly freed slaves 
who settled in Freedmanstown, section of Houston, to begin lives as free persons following the end of the Civil War. She has assisted us, and she is an educated historian and author, also has a museum, and also does tours of um, uh, very important historical factors. And Ms. Carey, would you just please stand? And we're going to submit her testimony into the record. Madam Chairwoman, I just wanted to acknowledge her uh, and thank her so very much for her leadership and her continued uh, work. I'd like to recognize Mr. Wall as well, uh, who will be actually testifying in H.R. 434, President of Houston's Freedmanstown Conservancy, whose mission is to protect and preserve the history of Freedmanstown, um, and has been a huge supporter of the Emancipation National Historic Trail uh, Act, uh, and as well has done major efforts to commit national organizations to the preservation of the very vital history in Texas. H.R. 434, the Emancipation National Historical Trail Act, designates as a national historic trail the 51 miles from the historic Osterman Building and Reedy Chapel in Galveston, Texas, along Highway 3 and Interstate 45, north to Freedman's Town and Emancipation Park in Houston. H.R. 434 requires that we study the post-Civil War history of newly freed slaves in a major slave-holding state following the largest military campaign waged on domestic soil in the history of the United States. This period is more than just a story about the North victory and the South loss. It is a, very, it is a, a story about new freed people emerging from over 400 years of slavery and how they survived in the 21st century. Uh, this finds its place in the list of uh, trails as maybe only the second trail that comments, comments on the history of slaves and African Americans in the United States. Certainly the one of the civil rights era, the Selma to Montgomery uh, march that was done just a few years ago. This would only be the second that would commemorate this history. Uh, this goes on to talk about Freemanstown has survived where others did not and is the only surviving 19th century community built by former slaves. They have a notable number of original structures that have been protected. So the trail would come to Freemanstown. Freemanstown became the center of opportunity for freed slaves. By 1915, over 400 African-American-owned businesses there. After emancipation, Freemanstown became one of the only sanctuaries for freed men in Houston, Texas. Today, Freemanstown hosts an impressive number of post-Civil War buildings. The actual trail tracks through a number of cities and historic mar uh, markers, which is really the benefit of this particular trail. We were able to find the historic markers from Galveston on, and we're excited that we have cities coming together around this historic trail and small towns which you don't often see. H.R. 434 require that a study be performed prior to any action taken placing, uh, place, taking place regarding the establishment of a National Historic Trail. To conduct the historic, the initial study, I'm committed to obtaining the needed uh, funding through this legislation to do so. Given the timing for the study of the Emancipation National Historic Trail being completed, I'm open to discussion with the committee, National Park, on the timing of the trail uh, being implemented. Again, uh, this is uh, unique in that it is one of only two possible trails. Uh, it is also important to note, as I conclude, Madam Chair, that the African American History and Culture Museum had history in Houston, Texas. Uh, the late Mickey Leland first offered to design a slaves museum here in, Houston, in, in Washington. Uh, it was that slave museum concept that John Lewis built his legislation to create the American African American Culture and History Museum right here. And so there is a connectedness. For that reason, I'd ask uh, this committee its indulgence uh, to um, provide a review of this and to allow this to pass out of committee and to pass again uh, on the House. Might I just very quickly uh, indicate that we have letters from the National Trust, uh, the Emancipation Park uh, Conservatory, uh, the um, Ms. Jackson Lee, I'm so sorry. Your time has expired. All right. We have uh, uh, without no objection, items. we will take every, what you have into the record. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your patience. As with the first two panels, oral statements are limited to five minutes, but your entire statement will be part of the hearing record. The lights in front of you will turn yellow when there is one minute left and red when time has expired. And I will, um, Mr. Nagoose, if you would like to introduce your witness. 
Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, I am honored to introduce, introduce uh, my friend, my colleague, and my constituent, Mr. Dan Gibbs, who is, uh, serves in Governor Jared Polis's cabinet as the Executive Director of Colorado's Department of Natural Resources. Director Gibbs is a former Summit County Commissioner. Uh, he's a certified wildland firefighter who has spent his career focused on Colorado's natural resources and public lands, and he leads one of our state's most important departments, overseeing the Division of Forestry, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, and the Division of Water Resources, among many other divisions. And finally, Director Gibbs was closely involved in the years of collaboration leading uh, to the creation of Title I of the Core Act, the Continental Divide, um, has a deep understanding of, uh, the understand of, of the collaboration that went into this bill, and so I'm certainly very excited to have him here with us today and for him to be sharing his experiences, his expertise, and his feedback. Mr. Gibbs, you have five minutes for your testimony. Chairwoman Holland, Ranking Member Curtis, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the Colorado Outdoor Economy and Recreation Act today. My name is Dan Gibbs. I'm the Executive Director of the Colorado Department of Natural Resources. I'm testifying today on behalf of Governor Pullis in the state of Colorado. Governor Pullis would have liked to be here today with his former colleagues to, to express his strong support for this legislation. As you know, as a member of Congress, Governor Pullis introduced a version of the Continental Divide Recreation, Wilderness, and Camp Hale Legacy Act, which has been incorporated into this broader core act. This legislation, the product of years of collaboration among elected officials, businesses, community members, and other key stakeholders across Colorado to protect some of the most beloved lands in Colorado for their unsurpassed recreation, scenery, wildlife, and unique values. As the Executive Director of the Colorado Department of Natural Resources, I support this bill because it will benefit our wildlife by protecting critical habitat and migration corridors. It will protect the outstanding recreational experiences that bring people from across Colorado and the world to these special places. It will help safeguard Colorado's water resources by protecting key watersheds and all water rights. It strikes the right balance by protecting key public lands from development while protecting all existing mineral rights and leaving other appropriate lands available for mining, oil, and gas development, and because it complements the values and opportunities associated with our state lands. The CORE Act is a combination of four previously introduced and broadly supported bills. The Continental Divide Recreation Wilderness and Camp Hale Legacy Act, the San Juan Mountains Wilderness Act, the Thompson Divide Withdraw and Protection Act, and the Cura County National Recreation Area Boundary Establishment Act. The CORE Act would designate five new special management areas to protect wildlife, recreation, watersheds, wild lands. It would protect four new wilderness areas and make additions to five existing wilderness areas. It would withdraw lands in the Thompson Divide and Natarita Canyon for mineral development and improve public land management through a number of other key provisions. Each of these proposals has involved significantly as a result of thorough research and collaboration. Together, they are a complementary set of proposals and the broad support each element of the bill enjoys has been unified by the CORE Act, with communities across the state now working together and committed to supporting each other. As a former county commissioner in Summit County, I was intimately involved in the years-long process of developing the Continental Divide portions of this bill. The thoughtful collaboration that went into it included careful design of the boundaries and management provisions including work with the Summit County Wildfire Council to ensure appropriate wildfire buffers near communities and appropriate wildland fire management flexibility where needed. This is just one of the many examples of how this comprehensive legislation has been carefully crafted and tailored to meet the needs of our communities while protecting our public lands. As a kid living in Gunnison, Colorado, the spectacular lands and waters of the Cura County National Recreation Area were my backyard and my favorite place to fish. I reveled in the unsurpassed beauty of the aspen forest of Kebler Pass, which the Thompson Divide provisions would help protect. Finally, this legislation designates Camp Hill near Leadville, Colorado, as our nation's first national historic landscape. This is where the Army's 10th Mountain Division trained to fight in the Italian Alps during World War II. Its veterans were instrumental in the founding of Colorado's ski industry, laying the foundations of the modern outdoor recreation economy. The 10th Mountain Division is proudly held dear by Coloradans and veterans have long been calling for protection and recognition of this important historic landscape. 
In Colorado, we have a long and rich tradition of public lands protection, with nearly 20 wilderness and other protective bills enacted over the last 54 years. But Colorado continues to grow and evolve, and the public lands that would be protected by this bill are critical to our continued prosperity and quality of life. They have been awaiting congressional action for too long. I hope the committee will move the CORE Act forward quickly. I would like to thank Representative Nagus, Senator Bennett, and their staffs for the long, hard work in putting together this comprehensive public lands proposal with us. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. The chair recognizes the Honorable Lauren West for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chair Holland, Ranking Member Young, and members of the committee. I am Council Member Lorraine West from the city of Santa Clarita, California. We are approximately 225,000 residents located within California's 25th Congressional District, which is represented by Congresswoman Katie Hill. I'm honored to be here today to thank Representative Schiff for sponsoring H.R. 1708 and to speak in support of the Rim of the Valley Corridor Preservation Act. For three decades, it has been my pleasure to work with government, environmental, business, nonprofit, and community leaders in building a framework in our region leading to enhanced partnerships between various stakeholders with the goal of preserving and enhancing the critical natural resources of Southern California. The Rim of the Valley Corridor Preservation Act is the long-awaited implementation of the Rim of the Valley Corridor Special Resource Study. This study, conducted by the National Park Service, was authorized in 2008 and transmitted to Congress in early 2016. I personally attended a number of outreach meetings conducted by the National Park Service during the study and the additional meetings held while the legislation was being developed. I can attest to the comprehensive outreach was sought to be responsive to everyone's needs, desires, and concerns. This legislation reflects the variety of perspectives expressed during those community meetings. As the study was being conducted and highlighted the significant ecological resources in the upper Santa Clara River area, which includes our community, Santa Creta, like many in Southern California, is under tremendous pressure to develop every available acre. Providing parkland, open space, trails, and recreational opportunities is something that my constituents care about and utilize on a regular basis. At the time, Santa Creta incorporated in 1987, given that our community is surrounded on three sides by beautiful mountain ranges, the Angeles National Forest and state-owned Santa Creta Woodlands Park, the city council made the decision to align with other agencies for the establishment of a green belt around the city as well as protection, enhancement, and interconnectivity of trails and open space. Additionally, we have partnered with other public agencies and nonprofit organizations to identify and preserve important wildlife corridors in the rapidly growing urban environment that is the greater Los Angeles area. Furthermore, in 2007, the voters of Santa Creta approved formation of an open space preservation district I was proud to lead that effort, which has resulted in the city of Santa Clarita owning and joining with other public agencies to acquire over 11,000 acres of open space. Public agencies, nonprofit, and the private sector working together will continue to enhance the quality of life and the physical mental well-being for residents of my community and throughout Southern California. Los Angeles County is considered to be park poor. The strengthening of partnerships and fusion of federal resources into the region brought about this bill has the capacity to touch approximately 13 million people with the greater Los Angeles metropolitan area. H.R. 1708 is important to our community because it is a solid pathway for the federal government to more fully participate as a partner with the city of Santa Clarita and other stakeholders in the region to significantly augment our collective open space, parklands, historical sites, and trails. For example, our interconnected trail system allows individuals to enjoy healthy activities such as walking, running, and riding their bicycles. Additionally, our community is home to over 6,000 employees of the film industry and a number of movie ranches. The open space venues in our community that are utilized by the film industry provide tremendous economic benefit to the local, state, and national economies. Companies choose to locate in Santa Cruz due to our community's proximity to open space trails and recreation areas, which provide amenities, where workers are seeking to enhance their health and overall quality of life. 
As an elected official of California's 18th most popular municipality, I appreciate the thoughtful approach that Representative Schiff has incorporated into the bill. H.R. 1708 does not seek to take any land use authority away from local government, require any property owner to sell land, or in any way diminish private property ownerships or management rights, or adversely impact the properties that are immediately adjacent to the proposed expansion of the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. Those specific provisions of the bill reflect that Congressman Schiff listened to concerns expressed during the community meetings and responded with appropriate assurances. The bill recognizes strong alliances that have been built throughout the region and seeks only to enable federal government to be a full partner with public and private stakeholders. With the availability of park resources and local resources such as Santa Cruz Open Space Preservation District, this bill can lead to leveraging modest federal investments which will lead yield high levels of return by creating enhancing amenities that residents and businesses value in making their decisions to locate in the community surrounding areas. I urge your support for 1708. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. West. Uh, the chair recognizes Ms. Lowell for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Hallen and Ranking Member Young and the subcommittee members. It is my privilege to testify in support of H.R. 434 the Emancipation National Historical Trail Act, introduced by my Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas. The trail act, when enacted, designates as a National Historic Trail the 51 miles from the historic Osterman Building and Reedy Chapel in Galveston, Texas, along Highway 3 and Interstate 45, north of Freedmanstown and Emancipation Park in Houston, Texas. In doing so, the trail act will preserve for generations to come the rich history of the newly freed slaves who journeyed to Houston in search of economic and political opportunity and greater religious and cultural freedom. It is a remarkable story and one that all Americans can be proud to share with the world. I serve as president of the Houston Freedmanstown Conservancy, whose mission is to protect and preserve the history of Freedmanstown for the future of benefit of generations, and we enthusiastically support H.R. 434 and the designation of the trail for the benefit of the local community, region, and the nation. Freedmanstown's residents, advocates, and preservationists have consistently offered their time, talent, and treasures to protect and preserve the history of the space since 1977. Most recently, the Preservation Coalition won a significant battle to preserve the Brit streets produced and laid by descendants of the formerly enslaved in the early 20th century. Without their efforts, this history would have been erased. This is just one example of the dedication and passion Houstonians have for this important and unique space. Another successful effort was the restoration and preservation of the Bethel Church Historic Site and the Gregory School, the first public school for freed slaves and their children. This collaboration was with the City of Houston and the Fourth Ward Redevelopment Authority. There were many challenges and unknown dangers associated with the routes the newly freed Africans took in search of freedom after emancipation. And for that reason, the routes used by the freedmen have attracted the interest by the International Historic Preservation Society. In 1994 of September, the UNESCO organization launched the Slave Route Project to identify and memorialize sites of memory around the world associated with the subject of slavery and human trafficking from Africa and its abolition in various regions of the world. Dr. Jane Landers, a UNESCO representative, as well as a professor of history at Vanderbilt University and a scholar of Africans in the Atlantic world, gave us her thoughts after visiting Houston in October. She stated that she was impressed by the documentation of Freeman's Town, the archaeology, the Texas Historical Commission markers, and she noted the case for its historic significance had been made through decades of preservation work. Her quote was, there is certainly enough research and history here that it should have a tremendous reception. If it were just a place where you knew once were slaves who became free, there are those all over the South. You have to have all the research, and the investment and the community that this has to make it a viable project. I am delighted to announce that as of March 2019, the following sites that are listed in the Emancipation National Historic Trail Act have been recognized as sites of memory associated with the UNESCO Slave Route Project. And that's the Port of Galveston, Emancipation Park, Freedmanstown, and the African American Library at the Gregory School, the Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, who was visited by Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip in 1991 in the Olivewood Cemetery. Houston and Galveston are well positioned to meet the demands of cultural interest and tourism of Mary. The state of Texas generates 7.3 billion in heritage tourism 
and the industry accounts for 2.5% of all travel to Texas. The trail's narrative represents the descendants and the survivors of the global transatlantic slave trade between Europe and Africa and the Americas, the greatest forced human migration in history. The trail also answers the question, what happened to the people who were taken from the shores of Africa's west, south, and east coasts? The guests visiting the trail will get a first-hand look at the arrival port in Galveston. They will also get a chance to travel to Freedmanstown and visit the mother ward, the original settlement, where is the original settlement where the descendants of those settlers continue to live. Historians have stated that it is potentially the largest linear architectural footprint still preserved in America of black urban life during the Reconstruction period. After you leave Freedmanstown, travel to Emancipation Park, for where more than 150 years, freedom celebrations have taken place. The Emancipation National Historic Trail will be a geographical passage identifying the beginning of the influence and significant contributions made by African children, women and men, and their descendants to the creation of this region and nation. This designation will enable members of the public, residents, and visitors to know the connection and relevance of this location to the national world history. I look forward to the subcommittee questions, and I hope the committee will allow and give a waiver to this important national moment. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lowell. Before we turn to our next witness, I'd like to give um, just 30 seconds to a uh, uh, distinguished uh, gentleman from uh, Texas, uh, Representative Jackson Lee, and had an opportunity to introduce you uh, as, uh, before your testimony. So. Well, thank you to the chairman, and I just wanted to emphasize uh, how grateful we are for the testimony of Eileen LaWall. She is president of the KMAC Foundation. The foundation supports the community efforts of KMAC International Corporation, a family-owned business, uh, and uh, she provides valuable leadership, as I indicated, through her philanthropic and volunteer work to numerous nonprofit organizations. In 2016, she served on the Mayor's Quality of Life Transition Committee, promoting historic preservation for the city's fourth ward, Freedman's Town, an original post-Civil War settlement, as she's described. She also serves as the current president of the Houston Freedman's Town Conservancy Board of Directors, whose mission is to protect and preserve the history of Freedman's Town for the benefit of future uh, generations. Um, Freedman's Town, of course, Freedman's Place after emancipation. And finally, she is a board member and past board chair of the United States Fund for UNICEF Southwest Regional Office. She co-chaired the Texas UNICEF AIDS Campaign for Children, Unite Against AIDS, the campaign raised over 1.5 million. And as well, she's a member of the Board of Directors of Society for the Performing Arts and on the Executive and Development Committees, also co-chaired the Grand Ball for China Gala, but also worked to preserve many historic sites in our community and work with UNESCO. She is well suited to advocate for H.R. 434. Thank you so very much. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Jackson Lee. And, and again, I thank the witness as well. Uh, and next, we'll turn to Mr. Walker Tuning. I hope I pronounced that right. Chair of the, oh, thank you, sir. Chair of the uh, Kettle Creek Battlefield Association. Thank you for joining us, sir. Mr. Chairman and committee members, good afternoon. Why does the Kettle Creek Battlefield in Georgia during the American Revolution in 1779 deserve your attention? As soon as most people hear of Georgia, they think of the Civil War. It was an important conflict, but today we are focusing on the American Revolution, the war that led to the formation of the United States of America, and the war that has resulted in all of us being able to meet here together today. Secondly, there were several American Revolutionary War engagements in the colony of Georgia during the War for Independence, but the Battle of Kettle Creek was the only engagement that the Patriots won in Georgia. The Battle of Kettle Creek is also a cemetery for soldiers who died during the battle. Eighteen graves have been located by cadaver dogs verified by ground penetrating radar, archaeological studies of the grave sites, and soil analysis. Fourth, the Kettle Creek battlefield is a pristine site. After the battle, the area returned to its agricultural roots, and no development has been made to the currently owned 252 acres in over 200 years. Fifth, in 2019, the state of Georgia, the 13th American colony, has no American Revolutionary War National Parks. How did the American, Revo American War for Independence come to Georgia? And the American Revolution began in Massachusetts in 1775, and despite numerous battles to subdue the American, the American Revolution in the northern colonies, in 1777, the war was at a stalemate. Britain 
was also at war with France and Spain, so the British reduced their forces in the northern colonies. The British turned to what they called the Southern Strategy. The strategy was to increase the size of the fighting force by recruiting what they thought were loyalists in the Georgia and the Carolinas. The British captured Savannah and Augusta and then moved into the back countries of Wilkes County and the Battle of Kettle Creek ensued. After 30 days in the Carolinas, Colonel Board planned to return to Augusta by way of Wilkes County, Georgia. Colonel Pickens, Colonel Clark, and Colonel Dooley had been searching for the British regiments when they heard the drum beats of the British forces along Kettle Creek on the morning of February the 14th, 1779. As Colonel Pickens advanced towards the British encampment, his scouts engaged British pickets slaughtering a stolen cow at the top of a ridge north of Kettle Creek and the battle began. The British commander, Colonel Ward, was mortally wounded in the first engagement and his troops began to flee, closely pursued by the Patriots. Major Sturgeon, now in command of the British troops, tried to defend a hill on the south side of Kettle Creek, but this defense also failed. Patriot leader Colonel Clark's horse was shot out from under him while he was crossing Kettle Creek, and he was given another mount by Austin Dabney, an African-American patriot who later received a war pension and land grant. As the battle ended, some British troops surrendered, some fled to Augusta, and others were left dying on the battlefield. Colonel Pickens ordered the British commander, Colonel Boyd, be given a Christian burial and released some of the loyalists as a reward for burying the dead soldiers where they lay. The battle was reported in newspapers as far away as Boston, Philadelphia, and London. Most notable statements on the battle were from George Washington. The defeat, this defeat broke the spirit of the Tories and preserved the quiet in the West. Also, General Pickens said in his memoirs, I believe that it was the severest check and chastisement the Tories received in South Carolina or Georgia. In 2011, the Kettle Creek Battlefield Association was created to facilitate preservation and land acquisition. Its fundraising efforts among individuals and local organizations in 2013 resulted in the purchase of additional 60 acres of the battlefield. This first acquisition in over 100 years gained the interest of the American Battlefield Trust and in 2017, an additional 180 acres was acquired with the help of the American Battlefield Trust Campaign 1776 and the Watson Brown Foundation. Current efforts have resulted in a significant increase of park visitation. This has economically benefited the seven rural counties in the area. Becoming a member of the national park system would gain the Kettle Creek Battlefield national visibility and increased visitation. It would be a positive economic impact on the counties in the area. The Kettle Creek Battlefield would be the first and only American Revolutionary Park in the state of Georgia. Where other battlefields have fallen to commercial encroachment, the Kettle Creek Battlefield has been preserved in a pristine condition. Here the visitors are able to lose themselves in history and step back in time to become a part of an important American history. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for coming today and for your testimony, and, and thanks to all the witnesses. Uh, members will now have five minutes to uh, ask questions of this panel, and I'll yield myself uh, five minutes to start. And I, I guess I would just start there with, the I, of course, have many questions for my uh, friend and former colleague, Mr. Gibbs, Director Gibbs, but before I do, would just say thank you to all the witnesses. Um, you know, each bill that we're hearing today, uh, there's some incredibly historic sites across America, whether it's Camp Hale and, and of course, my district, uh, or, uh, you know, Kettle Creek Battlefield, which I look forward to, to visiting, the Underground Railroad um, historical sites. So, again, just thank you all for your, your activism and your testimony and, and for being part of this process. Uh, Director Gibbs, it's, of course, an honor to have you in particular here today testifying before the committee. I want to thank you for traveling all the way to Washington, D.C., um, I also hope that you will extend my gratitude to our governor, uh, Governor Polis, um, who uh, led the charge with respect to one component of this bill, uh, the Continental Divide uh, piece, the title, uh, which is just an incredibly important piece of legislation that I am certainly very passionate about and really appreciate you being willing to come and, and raise the voices of thousands of Coloradans who care deeply about strong, thoughtful, and intentional protections and management of their public land. I I'd like to start by asking you to kind of just describe from your vantage point as a county commissioner prior to taking uh, your current role in the governor's cabinet, the collaboration that went into Title I of this bill. Because I think it's important to, for us to, again, contextually uh, be cognizant of just how much thought went into uh, developing this bill over the course of 10 years. I, I didn't have this data before, but I, this historical context, but thought it would be helpful as a precursor to your testimony. The 
Continental Divide Recreation Wilderness and Camp Hill Legacy Act was introduced in the 115th Congress, as you mentioned, by Senator Bennett and Representative Polis. The San Juan Mountains Wilderness Act was introduced by Senator Bennett in the 115th Congress. Uh, it was also introduced by Senator Mark Udall in the 113th, 112th, and 111th Congress, and by Representative John Salazar, um, Congressman Tipton's predecessor, in the 111th Congress. The Thompson Divide Withdrawal and Protection Act was introduced by Senator Michael Bennett in the 115th and the 113th Congresses. Um, the Krakanti National Recreation Area Boundary Establishment Act was introduced by Representative John Salazar as well in the 111th Congress. So obviously uh, many of these titles within the bill um, have, uh, have been thoroughly vetted before uh, this chamber, uh, before the, the House of Representatives before. So with that, Mr. Gibbs. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I got involved with this bill when uh, I was first elected as a county commissioner in 2010. And uh, I got certified as a wildland firefighter in 2006 and fought fires all throughout the West. So when I first, you know, heard about this bill, I was then, you know, a county commissioner and also was, um, was also the chairman of what's called the Summit County Wildfire Council. So, you know, my instincts in general would be, um, you know, to support a wilderness proposal, especially from uh, former Congressman Polis, someone I worked with very closely. Um, however, I really wanted to look at that with, with a lens in terms of what that would mean for my community. And we have about 30 wildfire incidents a year. And so um, Congressman Polis then, you know, worked very closely um, along with some of the advocates that were looking at the lines and the boundaries that, that impacted Summit County. And we worked closely to figure out, okay, well, instead of having wilderness in, in the particular area, let's have a special management area where you can do more, you know, proactive thinning in a particular area and let's reserve wilderness for other areas that are more appropriate. And so I felt like there was a really great balance in terms of bringing many different stakeholders, the, the firefighting community, the towns, um, the ski resorts, the, the various different user groups, the mountain bike groups that were very involved as well to really have, you know, nonstop stakeholder meetings to figure out what is appropriate where. And, and again, I looked through the lens of, of, of wildfire. Um, wildfires don't know the difference between federal, state, and private lands and really felt like um, the lines that were drawn in Summit County um, are the lines that really we're really the needs of our community, and that's reflective in other parts of the bill. We have county commissioners and mayors and business leaders from uh, all over the state of Colorado. Half of this room is filled with Coloradans that, that would say probably the exact same thing, that it's really collaboration-based. Thank you, Director Gibbs. And given that testimony, I'm, I'm uh, grateful that you touched on the, the issues concerning wildfires. I know those it came up, came up earlier. Uh, in this hearing, do you have any concerns that the Core Act would limit forest management or wildfire response that could place Colorado communities at an increased risk to wildfire? No, I don't. You know, I feel like the, the, the language gives flexibility where it's most needed. Thank you, Director Gibbs. Uh, with that, I would yield to Ranking Member Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, express my appreciation to Representative Jackson Lee for her bill. It sounds like a, a fantastic bill and certainly one that I think me and my colleagues would look forward to supporting in general. Um, we would hope, to, as this bill uh, progresses, to work with the bill sponsor and the Democratic colleagues to look at a couple perhaps technical uh, issues, uh, changes. One might be just uh, taking a quick look at property rights along the trail and making sure we're protecting those. And the second is um, uh, a quick look at the study that's uh, requested. Seems to be some timing questions on the study being finished and then immediately being enacted without a period of time to, to evaluate that study. Um, and just want to reemphasize, uh, looking forward to working with you on this bill and appreciate uh, this bill. And with that, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to Representative Heiss. I thank the gentleman very much. I'd like to welcome my friend Walker Tuning here Today, he's a graduate of Mercer University in Georgia, a retired U.S. Army captain, a great leader. Uh, he chaired many, many historic site committees in Georgia and beyond, and today, expert uh, with as president of the Kettle Creek Battlefield Association. I welcome you here and thank you. Uh, I, I believe deeply that Kettle Creek uh, has a lot to teach us. Uh, from the American Revolution and beyond, and the opportunity we have here 
to move forward with this, I, I think is important. This is a disappearing part of our history that needs to be preserved. And your leadership uh, is, is tremendous in that, and I believe Kettle Creek certainly rises to the level of uh, National Park unit status. So with that, let me ask you a couple of questions, Mr. Tuning. Uh, let, let's begin with uh, just why, why do you believe the Kettle Creek Battlefield rises to the level of National Park unit? Well, uh, it, first of all, it is really also a cemetery. Uh, as you walk the battlefield, it's probably the only place other than um, the um, little bighorn in which the soldiers were actually buried on the battlefield. We've located 18 of those soldiers and we've done archeological uh, studies on five of the graves. We did DNA um, investigation on them and confirmed that they were human remains. So this is not only just a battlefield, but it's a battlefield that contains the remains of soldiers that fell on that day in uh, February 1779. And, and, and it is a spectacular place in the work that you've done uh, what, what is the significance of this particular battle uh, to Georgia and the Revolutionary War as a whole? Well, like I said before, the uh, war for independence had basically become a stalemate in the north. Uh, France and Spain had entered uh, into the side of the uh, Patriots. Uh, so the uh, English had to remove troops from their um, Philadelphia and from New York to uh, defend their uh, colonial interests elsewhere in the world. So they devised the Southern strategy to uh, uh, try to raise what they thought were loyalists in the uh, Southern states of California and Georgia, or not California, but Carolinas and Georgia. Uh, so they sent Campbell into uh, uh, Savannah and Augusta and, and uh, Boyd up into uh, the Carolinas and Georgia to recruit. Uh, it's very significant because it was the first defeat of this uh, uh, British force in Georgia. Uh, it gave impetus to the fact that the you know, patriots were not going to be the loyalist uh, pool of soldiers that they were looking for. Uh, the Scotch-Irish residents in the areas of the Carolinas and, and uh, Georgia had basically fled to these areas to um, avoid the, um, get away from the English rule. So it was not the um, loyalist stronghold that they had expected, and it was an indication of what would eventually a result in Yorktown, which was their defeat. So although not as well known as some others, it was a turning point in the Revolutionary War, it and it needs to be point. preserved. Yes, sir. Our time's running out. Last question, uh, to, the, the steps that have been taken between local partners and the community to help pave the way for the National Park Unit status. How's that? Uh, well, the, the first step was uh, taken in 1899 when the DAR put up a monument with the help of the uh, Department of War, they put up an obelisk there. Uh, nothing was done again until 2008, which we had a uh, archeological study done by the uh, Mar Institute. And then in 2011, the KCBA was formed and we did a battlefield study that helped us to uh, project what we needed to do to preserve the battlefield. Um, we first uh, started raising funds to purchase uh, 60 acres from uh, the uh, um, you know, landowners to the north, and we raised those funds through local contributions and raised over $130,000 in about three months to purchase that 60 acres. Uh, that gave the uh, interest to the American Battlefield Trust, and they joined with us to purchase another 180 acres uh, back here in 2017. Uh, since then, we have done uh, several archaeological studies uh, of the um, uh, battlefield to determine the direction that the battle actually took. It um, completely thank, thank you, changed. Mr. changed yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you, Mr. Chuni. We're almost out of time, so we've been. I, I would like ask unanimous consent to submit to the record a letter from the American Battlefield Trust about the importance of uh, Kettle Creek. And I thank you very much and thank the witness. I yield back. Without objection, so ordered. And, and thank you again for your important testimony, um, sir. And with that, Ms. Jackson Lee. Again, let me thank the committee for its. Uh, important work and its courtesies and to all of the members who have bills. Um, I have learned so much in listening and reviewing and this is a very special committee. Uh, I am wearing uh, something called kente cloth was a reflection of the history of uh, many of uh, those who came as slaves to the United States. I'll be very quick to say to the ranking member um, 
Clearly, I look forward to working on the issue of property rights, and certainly I look forward to the clarification of uh, having the time to review the study before it being deemed a trail. And I thank you for that clarification, and we welcome that, and we welcome the committee's work on these trails. Uh, let me uh, quickly say that we have with us Ms. Carrier, and I just wanted to read one sentence uh, that reflects this trail and then ask a question of Ms. Lawal. Uh, this is from Ms. Carrier's statement. Through a syst systematic process of elimination and miseducation, much of what remains of the historical memory of African Americans has been lost and is in need of resurrection and revival, restoration, preservation. And this historic trail has the power to revitalize memory and restore dignity to the disenfranchised. The, the trail has the power to memorialize the memory of formerly enslaved persons. Uh, Ms. Lawal, uh, could you, uh, with your uh, broad uh, focus on history, uh, tell us how emotional, how important this trail will be, starting from where Captain Granger actually brought the proclamation two years later to announce that those slaves in that area were now freed. The importance of this trail is not only significant for Americans, but also for the world. Um, because of our relationship with UNESCO, we have discovered not only in Liverpool, England, do they have a slave museum memorializing our history, but also in Curacao. If you go to the uh, museum in Liverpool, you'll be able to take a, a walk and hear about what African Americans have done and, their, and the ships itself from Liverpool actually into Galveston. We actually have a Liverpool Tetris. But this space is rare and uncommon and cannot be duplicated. There is not another space left that represents the arrival of Africans into a space that shows the space where they lived, where they did traditional cultural practices that shows a built space that they built up. It's not a space that they moved into, it's a space that was raw land on the swampy banks of the Buffalo Bayou. They built the space, they built the streets, and after Harvey, as much as Harvey devastated Houston, my biggest fear was, oh my goodness, this project that these preservationists have been working on for the last 30 years has, been, has disappeared. Guess what? Five days, I went to Freedmanstown, the Brits were still in place, the structures were still in place. This shows the ingenuity and the skill set that these individuals had when they built this space. It was flood proof. The news station around the corner from there, Channel 13, I'm sorry, Channel 11, the entire news space flooded. It flooded so bad they had to move to the public library to do their newscasts. You won't find this place any, any, you won't find this any place else. And I get emotional because some of our uh, preservationists, when they were trying to destroy the Brit streets, they literally laid their bodies down in front of the bulldozers to prevent them from doing further damage. You will not find these Brits any place else. We have gotten confirmation from Dr. Jane Landers, who has done research on Africans and the history of Africans in the Americas for over 20 years. She herself, she herself said, there are no other Brits like this anyplace else that I've studied. I'm excited, we continue to be excited, and I invite you all to come and visit and we will give you a tour, a walking tour. I mean, we'll put you on a boat and take you down Buffalo Bayou and let you arrive at the space where it says Freedmanstown Preservation and take you in to see the schools, the churches. It was called the Mother Ward because it was the first ward. Now, after those children left the Mother Ward, they went into the third ward and the fourth ward and the fifth ward. So we have historical presence there as well. But it's Thank a you. wonderful space. Again, it cannot be duplicated. And if you're looking for something that the global audience wants to see, it definitely is Freeman's Town. We are attracting visitors from all over the world. And I can see this 10 years down the road, it's gonna be even bigger. You can go to the National Museum and see the Freeman's Town plaque. What I'd like to see for you to be able to scan that plaque and take a virtual tour of Freedman's Town. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to get in that we have, we, you can see her enthusiasm, her emotion. I just wanted to indicate that we have letters from the mayor of Galveston, uh, the mayor of Houston. We have letters from the National Trust. We have letters from the commissioners uh, where this land was, uh, Old Central Cultural Center, uh, and the Moody uh, Foundation. The Moody family is a historic family in Galveston. Uh, and of course, a number of other advocates. Emancipation, where it ends, is the first park in the entire nation bought by slaves, freed slaves, 
And so it is a historic trail, and I thank Ms. LaWall for her passion uh, and her very wonderful testimony along with Ms. Carrier. I have to put all these in the record along with the story of Freedmanstown. Thank you. Without objection. Uh, if Mr. Heiss has no questions, all right. Um, thank you to the witnesses again for their very valuable testimony. Uh, we really appreciate it, and certainly to the members for their thoughtful questions. Uh, the members of this committee may have some additional qu questions for the witnesses, and so we will ask you to respond uh, to those in writing. Under Committee Rule 3, sub subparagraph O, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. Uh, if there is no Chairman, further... Yes, Chairman, Ms. a courtesy Ms. Jackson Lee. to announce that Mr. Harry Johnson is in the room. He is the creator and founder of the Martin Luther King Monument that has become one of the most popular monuments uh, in the nation. I just thought I'd put that on the record. He is present. Thank you, Ms. Jackson Lee, and, and thank you, Mr. Johnson. If you, may, if you would stand so we can acknowledge you. Thank you again for being here and for your service to our country. Um, if there is no further business, without objection, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>